Jones with Sage, number 18, Will Howard. Welcome into a Monday edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online as we get ready to tie a bow on another Sunflower Showdown victory for the Wildcats. Uh, just the, uh, I think, what ends up being in this 15 straight wins at K-State's rattle off, just the third game decided by single digits uh, in that time frame. And everybody remembers 2018, 2009 was a memorable one. 2023 going to end up being a memorable one for uh, a lot of different reasons. The Cats, I would say, I you know, without doing any extensive research, 11 points is the largest deficit that K-State has faced in the last 15 years against KU, and they overcame it to make sure that they came out on top with a very close 31-27 to 27 win. D.Y., this is kind of the first time we're getting to talk to you since uh, – it all went down. What do you make of the Wildcats win in Lawrence to get one over on the Jayhawks? Uh, it was a lot of resolve, right? You can get down 11 points there and feel like you're toast. Um, I know a lot of fans did. I saw a lot of uh, what con- concession tweets from Kansas State fans. <laughs> that Some of them were deleted. Some of them weren't just mm-hmm. because they, they thought it was over as well. But Kansas State didn't. And that's kind of the – the theme of this year's team, they, they have very short memories. You know, they can have a bad play and the next one they're reeling off a huge one. Like, you know, Keaton Garber last week or Will Howard against KU, right? Because, I mean, he almost gave them a win, let's be honest, with that pick six that was dropped. Yeah. And instead of playing fearful and pissing down his leg the rest of the way, he goes and scores two more touchdowns and Kansas State wins. So it, a tough win. Um they really dug themselves a hole. I wouldn't. The defense didn't have a lot of answers for the majority of the night. Uh, they they did make the adjustments just in time. In the offense, I thought actually played well. I just think maybe it doesn't look like it quite so much because in the first half they barely had the ball. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's true. the The first half was kind of weird and the the pacing of it and everything. I thought K State really made the most of it. Um, at times offensively in the first half, they had that little lull there where they couldn't get a ton going. They had some setbacks, but uh, they did what they could. It's just the defense was in shambles for uh, close to two and a half quarters of the game. They just could not get any answer for KU. They struggled to, to get anything figured out. And then finally, once they were able to kind of put the kibosh on the, the run game, for KU that a lot of it came out of the wildcat and a lot of stuff going on pre-snap. Then you force Cole Ballard to have to make more plays and to make bigger plays. And that's just not something that uh, a guy like that is in a position to be able to do at this point in his career. I mean, he's, he's a third string walk on freshman quarterback that he's not expected and he shouldn't be doing things like that. And because of KU situation at quarterback, I mean, there's a there's a lot to go on in their quarterback situation, but because of that, he was in that position and he had to go out there and try and do some things. And uh, he, unfortunately for KU, was not able to do it. Very fortunately for K State, they were able to force him to make some uh, costly errors, and uh, also the biggest being that interception by Marquis Siegel in the end zone. So, uh, I, the the way I look at this game for K State, and I've already said it a handful of times, but uh, this was kind of a, a symbolic win, and and an important one for K-State because so many of the things that went down in the game against Missouri and Oklahoma State and Texas where you put yourself in a hole, but uh, the defense, which had struggles in all those games, eventually settled down and gave the opportunity to the offense. The offense had never been able to fully overcome it in those prior three games. They were finally able to do it against KU. It took a while, but, I mean, really – I think it, it feels like it took a while, but K-State scored with over 10 minutes left in the game to take the lead and then never gave it back up. So they, they played keep away uh, on the lead, and they did a good job then of bleeding it out when they had five and a half minutes left and got the ball back. But uh, K-State, that, that was a big one for them to kind of prove they could overcome some things and uh, prove that they're not a soft team that just loses road games. Yeah, you kind of hit the nail on the head there where, you know, these close games, especially on the road, all of them were on the road that they lost previous. 
they were making plays in those games, but when they needed to make one more to win, they were coming up short. That's what happened against Texas. That's what happened against Missouri when he had a chance to extend the lead, uh, and then you gave Missouri the ball back and chance to win, and they took it. And Oklahoma State, you still had chances there too, even though you were – that was more – you just being flat, not showing up, so to speak. But, you know, the I think the main difference was in the second half defensively was getting Cole Bauer into some third and longs because uh, obviously that was going to put him in, in a disadvantageous spot. Excuse me. Um, and you you are making those pl- – the play. Like the play was, you know, the interception. Um, you know, Will Howard, the, the run on for the touchdown – to kind of uh, get you going there a little bit as well. You get you had a touch on past the King and Johnson, you had a touch on past the Ben Senate. DJ Giddens pops in the end zone in the second half as well. It it was not always pretty and it wasn't always likely, but because of the way KU played, they played their hearts out. They're they're a much better team. Lance Leipold sat again about closing the gap. I roll my eyes a little bit at that because that's a really like the moral victory pose there, but he's true. He's right. They have narrowed the gap. And I'll say this. I don't know if I mentioned it on any of our shows, but Stan Weber, a wise man once told me and that wise man with Stan Weber said that in a rivalry like this one, a road win is almost good enough for two wins most of the time because you're not going to expect to lose at home. So, I mean, K State may have put this thing on ice for you know another couple of years, if you think about it that way. And look, uh, KU fans are going to blame it because they had to play third string walk on quarterback. What I would say is, with the offense that they assembled around that kid, yeah, well, this game alone that probably made it more challenging on Kansas State. Yep. No, I I 100% agree. I mean, I I said it on our boards, and then I mentioned it on the, the Sunday show with Drew and Fan. I. I think that their circumstance at quarterback led them to rolling out an offensive game plan that had K State on the rails, and tough, they tough they were yeah. yeah they they were they just you just don't know what's going to happen where to go and it, yeah. it's even tougher considering K State's situation where so much of defending what KU threw out there comes down to being smart, having leaders on the field, and being disciplined, and that's really tough to do when you know you're without Daniel Green. And then you're without Jake Clifton. And so now you're down to either a true freshman in Austin Romain or a guy like Bo Palmer that has not walk seen on. tons of snaps. Yeah, walk ons. Yeah, well, and there you go. Your quarter, quarterback of the defense was a walk on. You know, you don't hear K State fans talking about that. Um, no, he actually played really well. <laughs> so, and Chris Kleiman, you know, said after the game, like, hey, we, we just had to make the decision there to, to start going with the guy that had more experience. And, uh, Bo Palmer did play well in the game and, and made things happen at times. So K State overcame it, and I'm with you. I, I really do think that the outcome of this game is probably similar, no matter who is at quarterback for Kansas. And, and we, we've said this all year long for the last however many years of this Lance Leipold era. It does not matter who plays quarterback at KU. It, it matters that Andy Kotelnicki is up in that press box calling plays and designing the offense. You know. Uh, he is he is that good at it, and the credit is deserved to him and Lance Leipold for what they've done. But uh, and obviously Jalen Daniels, Jason Bean, talented guys. But the the KU success is truly a credit to what they have done, and K State was able to overcome it. The defense got things figured out. Um, Joe Klanderman adjusted enough. I know people were ready to to fire him and tell him to get lost after the first half and probably mid third quarter, but uh, things got adjusted well. And uh, K-State proved again, why they, you know, have been probably the the best and most consistent team in the big 12 over the last two seasons. Now Uh, they were able to make their adjustments and execute finally when the uh, opportunity presented itself. So all very good there in the Wildcats win. And now they sit at eight and three chance to be nine and three. If they can take down Iowa state this weekend, at home. Uh, any final general thoughts on the game before we break down with our over and unders that Drew said on Friday? I just, I just think people need to maybe not like, it sounds like I'm trying to get, take the bullets for Joe Klanderman here, but, but what he was tasked with on Saturday night was pretty tough. Like they didn't even know where Cole Ballard was going to line up. 
and then they were running him in motion. All the stuff that you don't that you hadn't seen yet from KU. I think it was a tough, tough task, a tall task, and and I think he he adjusted well in the nick of time. Like you you go another minute or two, and I'm not sure Kansas State wins, but um, I just. I think he should probably deserve more credit for how they recovered than the criticism for what happened in the first half. Yeah, no, I uh, I think think you're right there. All right, over unders time. Taking a look at uh, how things played out with uh, our weekly game. DJ Giddens scrimmage yards one thirty and a half. Uh, Drew and I both took the over. You were the wise man. You took the under. That's what ended up happening. DJ Giddens ends up totaling. Uh, 106. So he came up just shy of that. Uh, he got plenty of touches in the game, 23, 21 carries, two catches, but uh, he comes up uh, basically 27 yards shy of what Drew and I needed him for. So uh, even though he didn't get to the number that Drew had put out there, DJ Giddens was probably still the number one or number two star in this game for K-State because he ran hard and he he was a big deal for the Wildcats and coming out on top against KU. That uh, and I'm lucky, right? Because that number probably goes easily over if Will Howard doesn't miss him twice. Um, one in the middle of the field where he threw behind him and off Giddens' hand, and another along the sideline where he just airmailed the ball when he was. Um, pretty open and so the, you, you get those two and it and that's a whole different ball game and you got you got also take an effect take an account the volume right lower volume because of how few plays Kansas State ran I think they ran ended up running just a hair over 60 plays I believe mm -hmm. um, but I, I if I recall I still think that's the fewest this season for Kansas State yeah, the Cats ran 61 plays, but you know, if you now that they're still plays technically and everything else, but you take out even the kneel downs at the end and everything, you're you're under 60 for the game uh, that you ended up having to run to to get things done. So it was a minimal effort there. Uh, look, the, like you said, the opportunity was there for DJ Giddens to maybe have more of a couple of plays hit here and there, but. He came through when they needed him to, averaged almost five yards a carry and put together a strong showing and was just a, a workhorse and ran hard at the end when K-State needed it to happen. So uh, very much impressive for what was able to go on there for DJ Giddens, and he helped uh, K-State come out on top. And we saw probably the most personality and excitement we've ever seen from DJ Giddens after the game uh, out there uh, when he was talking to the media. So that was that was fun to see. Uh, next one on the list, this one, so uh, props to you. You were the only one to get the DJ Giddens one correct with the under. Total quarterbacks to take a snap. Boy, Drew thought he was dead set on this, uh, and I, I tried explaining to him my logic, and I think you and I were the same way. The The total quarterbacks to take a snap was a was at three and a half, and I just said, look, I, I think there is a chance that K-State plays two quarterbacks, uses two of them at some random point, but – I was with you, either Jason Bean is playing in that game and he's playing the entirety of that game, or Jason Bean is not playing in that game, and so the only option is Cole Ballard. And as it turned out, Cole Ballard was, in Lance Leipold's eyes, the only option because afterwards he did say that Jason Bean yeah. was cleared and they chose not to play him. And I, Look, I, I get the logic behind it, and I'm not going to crush Lance Leipold for it because I really don't care what Lance Leipold does or what goes on for University of Kansas football. But I know KU fans are going to be questioning that quite a bit and saying, you know, what, what's the deal here? What's the problem? Why, If he was good to go, why would you not play the more talented guy? Uh, even though, as we've discussed, that may not have mattered and honestly may have hurt KU. I think if you're a little more traditional in your offense, I don't think it's as big of a deal for K-State to have to try and defend. Uh, but I will note this on Lance Leipold. Two of his three seasons now at KU, that you could question a certain moment in quarterback management for him. Because the the first year he was there, Jalen Daniels did not play until late in the season. Now, I know that they say that there was some injury stuff to that, but I, I don't remember in the moment that being discussed. And then they kind of messed around, and they, they didn't end up using a, a red shirt that season on him when really they could have. 
It's just a very strange deal. I think sometimes this quarterback management is a little bit off. Uh, what did you make of the quarterback play in the game and mostly the move to not use Jason Bean for KU? I think the choice not to use Bean was probably because he hadn't he didn't practice all week. I think if you can't take just one rep, they weren't comfortable throwing him out there because you're talking about all the preparation, right? Everything you prepare yeah. for, you didn't prepare for having Bean. Like, obviously, you saw the offense around Cole Ballard. That was a specific offense catered to that kid that they wouldn't have ran with Bean. Now, so I, I understand maybe some hesitation to throw Bean out there and basically run a bunch of plays that they didn't even go over this week. Yeah, I, I think it's smart. Uh, K-State side of it, are you surprised that we didn't see Avery Johnson at, at all, or is that just kind of the game played out in a different way and so it, it dictated not using him and riding the experience of Will Howard? Not surprised. This tight game, and I thought the offense wasn't horrid, right? We've already covered that. But that se sequence where Howard does throw a pretty poor interception and then almost – combats it with another pick six, I think maybe you start to think a little bit at that point. Yeah. Uh, but the, he recovered, I know, always does. You know, so. He did He did recover, came back, looked fine, got K-State the win and made winning plays at the end. It was far from the best game of Will Howard's career and like the best statistical output. Uh, statistically, it looks pretty gross when you look at it on you know the, the stat broadcast, but at the end of the day, like, he made the winning plays. He he led the charge for K-State to get back in, and I think that's a significant deal. So uh, I think props should be given to, to Will Howard for how he played in the game, despite some of the mistakes or the ones that could have happened. But Chris Kleiman talked about it afterwards. I think everybody will point it out on the K-State side. If you look at how everything went down, like both teams had moments in that game where they were fortunate that one thing happened and another didn't. And like, for KU, um, it's the fumble public. that turned into a 25-yard gain. Um, <laughs> that uh, That's the most bizarre thing to, to happen in that game. And obviously then for K-State, it's that you're fortunate that Will Howard doesn't throw that pick six because K-State, you know, ended up taking advantage of it and coming back and, and winning the game. So Because I think if you go down 34-16, I don't know that K-State's coming back from that in a game that looked like it did. And, you know – I think a lot of KU people are focusing on the fact that now two years in a row they've had muffed punts that have been major flaws in what's gone on. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, and I've always said this because I, I can remember the 2015 K-State KU game, it, it cracks me up. Uh, a guy that I know that was a, that's a, was a KU grad, he brought it up. He was like, well, you know, it, because this, this, and this all happened in the game, that's how it ended up being – K-State ended up winning that game 45 to 14. He's like, but really it wasn't that close. And I was like, okay, well, yes, you could take that out, but you know why that stuff happened? It's because KU is not as good as K-State. And the reason why the stuff that happened that cost KU the game on Saturday is because they're not as good as K-State. Lance Leipold is right. The gap is closing, but there's still a gap. K-State is still the better team. They are still the better program. And they will continue to be for at least another couple of years. I think that they, they will be for a long time. But the reason bad plays happen to you and you make those mistakes that cost you games is because you're not good enough. And that's what happened. And K-State was not good enough against Missouri this year. And that's played out. Missouri is a better team than K-State this season. K-State was not good enough in Austin. That is true. Texas is a better team than K-State this year. The Oklahoma State thing, K-State played their F game, so I'm not going to throw that one into the mix. But most of the happen. time, most of the time when you lose a game, it's because you are the worst team. And KU lost that game because they are the worst team. So I, I would not focus too hard uh, if you're a K-State fan and try to fight through whatever BS the, the Jayhawks are spewing your way. Yeah, although I guess your quarterback's going to be selling insurance in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, all right, K-State players to record a catch. Six and a half was the number. We all took the over. We were all wrong. I even went as far uh, out as just basically listing the guys that I thought would make a catch. And it was basically like, this is a really easy one. Look at all these options that Will Howard can throw the ball to. Uh, the Cats only completed 13 passes, and they only came to five different targets. And uh, that's how the, the game ended up going. Coincidentally, Phillip Brooks, who we would have thought would have been an easy call for that 
he didn't catch a ball until the very last pass of the game. Um, what did you make of K-State's passing game when it came to, to the effectiveness and the usage uh, in this game? Because obviously it was one on the ground by both teams. Uh, I thought it was explosive, right? You had the one to Jace Brown over the top. Uh, you had Ben Sinner with a with the one as well. Keegan Johnson got a touchdown. I thought it was good enough, but it was still a little ugly. I think you you really missed on some opportunities too. I I don't think it's a sign of a poor design or or a poor team, but. I think number 18 missed a couple. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's obvious and fair. Uh, I'm sure that he would probably look at it the same way and everything else um and and admit to that, but they made them when it counted. Yep, to overcome it and you know, he made the throw to Philip Brooks which was big, uh a crucial one to Jace Brown where he whips back out and uh, is able to race for, you know, a pretty big gain that probably could have been more because I think a lot of people assumed that it should have been a horse collar uh, tackle on Jace Brown. It ended up not getting called. And then they reviewed it to see where he stepped out at, which was the weirdest thing in the world. Cause it's like, well, second he got, I, I don't know. That was, that was a weird thing to stop and review uh, in the moment. I, I didn't think it was a great officiating crew on Saturday. And I'm sure KU fans would agree as well. Um, probably cause they were upset at the amount of holds and pass interference calls that were thrown their way, but it probably could have been more. Uh, if you think about how KU's defense looked. Uh, the next one, Rex Van Y snaps 26 and a half. Uh, he played a heavy amount in the Baylor game, and we know that, hey, the restriction is gone. He can play now. We didn't see a single snap. Well, I guess we got one snap from Rex Van Y. Uh, he got one snap in the game. But outside of that, he was not in there defensively for K-State. Um I mean, we, we talked already about the Bo Palmer situation coming through for K-State and what they had to do. Um, were you surprised that we saw basically next to nothing of Rex Van Wy in this game? Yeah, I, I think they just wanted experience out there against that KU system. I really do, because I think they saw what was happening to Austin Romaine. We're like, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if this is right. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, quickly move on. Final one, Will Howard, yards per pass attempt. We talked a lot about the passing game. It was eight. Uh, Drew took the under. He's the, the lone winner on that category. You and I both took the over. We th we were thinking the right way. We both talked about how, hey, this is going to be when a pass situation is there for K-State, it will pop off in a big way. And that really was the case in the game for K-State. I mean, they ended up completing 13 passes in the game. And if you go and, and look at what took place, they had a couple of big ones and they were able to strike, but uh, they, they ended up throwing the ball a little bit more and a lot of passes that fell to the ground incomplete. Uh, and that ends up kind of tainting the number, but I think it was a good process, bad result for you and I on the uh, missed attempt there. Yeah. I, it should have went right. You would have thought, I mean, the, the the opportunities were there. We talked about a couple of the misses to to DJ Giddens or some other guys in the game, and so I think the opportunities were there for it to happen. Just you know, Will Howard had some struggles with the accuracy and making those plays early on, and um, some of the other plays too. There there was some grabbing. We talked about that. Uh, I think the most upset and animated I've seen Chris Kleiman. Uh, outside of when he's got a quarterback laying on the turf with a severe injury uh, was when he was ripping one of the officials after the Will Howard interception. They wanted a hold or something to be called uh, on Ben Sennett. And Chris Kleiman was going after the ref. Connor Riley was over there losing his mind. I was really surprised that, that they didn't get flagged for it, honestly, the way that uh, the reaction was. It was pretty strong and in the ref's face for basically the entire – uh, TV timeout that had followed the pick, but you know it, it worked out for K State. I I'm not I'm not too too beat up about it because I do think that we had the right mindset here. It just didn't work out in our favor. Yeah, I got you. All right. Uh, any final thoughts from the win over KU before we uh, we move on and we can get some uh, quick words in about Iowa State coming to town this weekend? 15, 15 straight. Okay, well, it's short and sweet and uh, very, very important. 
to note. 15 in a row, pretty impressive number uh, that K-State has has ripped off here. Uh, thinking about some of the other games in the, the streak that K-State's put together, I, I did immediately think of, uh, you know, my I, I was a big Alex Delton guy. At least I played one on the radio uh, to combat John Kurtz. Um, the run and playing out of the game was very similar to 2023 and 2020 or 2018. Alex Delton runs in, didn't play the best game for K-State. K-State trailed the majority of that game, probably did not deserve to win that game. And he runs into that left side of the end zone with like an 18-yard run or something. Very similar to Will Howard, who had his struggles in the game. KU put up more yardage, did a lot of things in the game that you thought, hey, maybe they should have won the game. Maybe they were the more deserving team. And that same end zone in the left side, just doing it in Lawrence instead of Manhattan, goes in and uh, breaks some Jayhawk hearts. So uh, I love that. That's uh, that's very entertaining for me. And, uh, yeah, that's that's all I have to say on uh, my, my final takeaway from the game. And I do think I'm right. I think that the 11 points that K-State trailed by, that's the largest deficit they faced at any point uh, in this 15-year streak that they've been on. Because, uh, you know, 9 was close, but they were never down big in that game. They actually led uh, for a majority of it. And then I think the, oh, the next biggest deficit that K-State would have faced would have been 2012. Uh, K-State was down seven a couple times early in that game before just kind of running away with it. So uh, th- those are the, the final notes. I, I know we mentioned the muff putt may, being a big deal, but I, we would be remiss if we didn't mention Keenan Garber's touch or yeah. two point defensive two-point conversion. Because think of it this way, right? Kansas State won by four points. He doesn't get that. K-State doesn't go for two on offense either. Yeah. So that takes you down four points, and you're sitting there um, with 28, right? And so if KU's driving like they were, they can kick a field goal there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, and Chris Kleiman talked about it afterwards, too, about how like KU was having to kind of chase those points the entirety of the game. And, I mean, the, the final score differential ends up coming down to the two-point conversion that K-State gets and the, the blocked extra point that they ran back. And that was that's not just big for how the game played out on the scoreboard, but just momentum-wise for K-State, where it felt like that was a really tough and scary point in the game, and you were able to get some momentum back, and then they they were able to take the ball and score. And honestly, the game could probably play out different if K-State is able to get a stop right after the touchdown to go up 16-13. to 13. And instead, they did let KU go down the field and, and score right before the half. I'll, I'll, this will be the last thing I talk about from this game, but it's kind of a bigger, broader picture thing. We've noticed it a handful of times this season, but we kind of just chalked it up to, hey, K-State's been getting the ball first, so things haven't worked out the best. Chris Kleiman makes a really big deal about the middle eight, which is an important aspect of the game, and, and Fan will talk about it a lot of times in his analysis. K-State has not been that good in that department this year they were really bad against KU with it they gave up 14 points in the middle eight uh, and put themselves in an 11 point hole because of it uh what do you make of K-State's struggles in the last part of the first half and the start of the second half and I mean obviously there's just two games left in the season but how important is uh those struggles being addressed moving forward well it needs to be addressed what I will say is I don't think it's so much a strategic or approach problem i think they know they know how important it is and and what good goes into it and and i don't know that they've really emphasized it you know before but what i so i, I think it's just like a lack of execution it really hurt in this game though because you already had the ball hardly at all in the first half they score at the end they get the ball first in the second half um, that's happened before this year, but it was just, I thought magnified in this one because of how many, how few of possessions that they were seeing. So, uh, I mean, they got to figure it out, but I think it's more of a, you know, it's a less about the decisions and more about the play. Yeah. All right. Iowa state coming to town. What are the early thoughts on the cyclones as they, uh, get ready to, to come to Manhattan after they lost by 10 at home to Texas on Saturday? I guess going back to that, the only problem I might have a little bit 
is there such an assistance this year to get the ball first? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Sometimes they've just lost coin toss. So I think maybe they need to consider that a little bit moving forward. Um, Iowa State, look, I've said this for a few weeks, and you know this, and and everyone else is about to as well. I don't think Iowa State's any good, right? I I really don't. I think this is a team that is pretty fraudulent, um, boosted by their schedule yeah. and who they and who they have played because they really haven't done anything besides taking care of business against really bad teams. They don't have one good win. People are going to say, "What about Oklahoma State?" That was before Oklahoma State was any good. Yeah, right. That was before the bye week when Oklahoma State seemed to fix everything. So they didn't even beat the a good version of Oklahoma State. And they said, you know, I know it ended up only being a seven-point game, but I think they were down by almost 21 at one point. But they got dominated at home. for the, They came back, like I said, mm-hmm. it was only a seven-point game. But KU controlled them in Ames yeah. at night for almost the entire game. Now, hey, Iowa State just hung with Texas. Texas lets everybody hang. Um, that doesn't really do anything for me. So I, I just think this is one of the more overrated teams in the Big 12. Yeah, and it's starting to play out. I mean, Iowa State is six and five right now. If they lose on Saturday, they'll they'll finish six and six. They feel like a six and six football team. And I'm with you. I, I this is the way I looked at it from the start. Uh, Iowa State had a very easy first month and a half of Big Twelve play. Like you said, they got bad Oklahoma State at home. Like the, Oklahoma State is one of the examples, and this doesn't always happen, but a legitimate 180 in their season. They are a different team for the last eight games they've played as opposed to the first four that they played. And then Iowa state got their butt kicked at Oklahoma, a tough road environment at night against a good team. Sounds like what they're about to walk into in Manhattan. And then they got TCU at home. TCU has been bad this season. They played at Cincinnati. Cincinnati is God awful at Baylor. Baylor is God awful. And to your point, they did get dominated at home by Kansas. The KU scored, KU scored 28 points. They scored a touchdown in each quarter, and it really wasn't all that close. I mean, Iowa State had an opportunity at the end, but KU led 21 to three late in the third quarter, and they were able to kind of keep Iowa State at arm's length. And then, yeah, they they hung with Texas. What would you do? Everybody seems to do that this season. Um, so I think that this is a game where, I mean, it's not going to be easy for K-State by any means, but K-State playing at home, everything going into it, K-State should be able to take care of business against Iowa State. I think that this feels like a game that K-State probably wins like 31 to 10 or 13 or something weird like that, where I I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be crazy close. I, I don't think it's a blowout like TCU in Houston, but I don't think it's, you know, you're biting your nails the last two minutes of the game, like Iowa State games of of yesteryear. Yeah, it's probably in the middle of those. So I, I think you're probably right. You know, this particular game, I think Kansas State's really playing themselves more than anything. Yeah. Because I think the biggest hurdle is rebounding from such a high because mm-hmm. I've never really seen Kansas State really bask in a win the way that they did when they beat KU. I mean, they're doing the Wabash with the band afterwards. They're, you know, talking a bunch of shit, really, taunting the fans, um, hanging around, taking pictures on the field, even though I think they do that a lot for wins. So KU being mad about that is kind of strange because I don't think that's anything that Kansas State hasn't done before. They've they've done that after every road win. Uh, Yeah, that's what they do. That's uh, I don't know why KU feels like they're being wrong there. I've seen a little bit of that, and that's silly. But – I think Kansas State needing to redirect their focus from KU to Iowa State. I think there's some challenges associated with that just because you could tell how much this win meant to them. Yeah. No, that is, uh, that's, that's true. I, I think they'll be able to do it. Though. I'm not too worried about it. Um, all right. Uh, real quick thoughts from the weekend in the Big 12. Uh, K State and KU obviously been discussed, Texas and Iowa State a little bit. Uh, anything else stand out to you other than maybe the fact that? Uh, K-State's opportunity to get to the Big 12 title is next to minimal now, especially after Houston and BYU blew golden chances to let a team like K-State have that opportunity. Yeah, they came actually pretty close to it. I mean, Houston had Oklahoma State down by multiple scores. BYU had Oklahoma on the ropes. 
So um, for me, the takeaways there are Oklahoma State's not good enough to really pull away from bad teams. I think they're just a gritty football team. Uh, so they're always going to invite disaster a little bit, I think. And for Oklahoma, I don't think it's about not being good enough. It's about being poorly coached and not being disciplined enough to take everyone on your schedule seriously. And I said that was going to be a problem mm -hmm. for them even after they beat Texas, and we still see it. I don't think Kansas State's going to be blessed with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State losing this upcoming week, but it's it's a non-zero chance just because Oklahoma State is still average enough to keep everyone around, and Oklahoma is – always a disaster a, a, a you know a second away from disaster because they're so poorly coached yeah. so i wouldn't pick it but those two teams are vulnerable just about every week because of it i think texas at this point is in really take care of business mode um i was actually kind of impressed you know they never really invited disaster too much against iowa state i think the longhorns Look, I, I think they're going to end up in the college football playoff. But um, I, so I think I'll, you know, Kansas State's path is is thin because Texas is taking care of business, and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State surviving by you know razor thin margins. Good win by West Virginia turned out to be a really solid season. Happy for Neil Brown. Um, that's more of a product of Cincinnati being terrible, though. I would say. Yeah, Cincinnati is the worst. They and. and you know, UCF doesn't give a shit because they lost, but I give them credit. I thought they were going to get blown away in Lubbock. Yeah, I uh, I wish they would have gotten blown away in Lubbock. Sure. They did not, though. Uh, UCF, big one this weekend at home against Houston. Uh, the Knights need it to get to bowl eligibility and uh, fill it up. I think uh, I talked about this yesterday with Drew, but, you know, as much as we talk about how things are changing in the Big 12, a lot of th things are – Remain the same. KU now in eighth place in the Big Twelve. Uh, that's yeah. uh, that's you know not the most shocking thing, I guess. Uh, another thing, because uh, we're talking about these tiebreaker scenarios, of what I will say is that I think if it's a two-way tie or or even a three-way tie, if the other team, like in the case of if it's OU, OSU, and KSU, OSU should get that because of the head-to-head. -head. But if a head-to-head -head is not on the table, instead of all these obscure other tiebreaker scenarios that they are coming up with, I really think they should make it who's to break the highest in the college football playoff. Because yeah, I I think having such complicated tiebreakers like that now that they're getting themselves into because of no divisions and being 14 teams yeah. and then next year being 16 teams. And by the way, all these other leagues are going to invite the same problems because they're yeah. doing it too with no divisions and, and being a super conference is that basically every year you're going to have a team advance to your conference championship because of some obscure thing and not yeah. necessarily anything predicated on something that matters. So, you know, after a head to head um, scenarios have been exhausted. I really think it should be uh, ranking in college football playoff. I I do agree with that because I mean, you want to be able to put your best options forward for that game and also for the the outcome of that game. Uh, you, I mean, the That's Big Twelve would much rather have Texas. I mean, I don't know that they care about Texas's success, but a team like Texas coming out of the Big Twelve, you would rather them have a win against what might ultimately end up being a top 15 K-State team next week. Or Oklahoma. What it, yeah, you know. or Oklahoma. The, right now it's set up that it's probably going to be Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State's not even – I mean, they're going to be fringe ranked probably when yeah, it's and see, and, game. and the reason why teams or conferences eliminated divisions is for this reason because they didn't want a top team to play a weak opponent – not get another data point of another impressive win. And also not they did this so they didn't invite the disaster of a horrible loss at the end of the year. Like for instance, like if Ohio State or Michigan go and play Iowa and lose, like what good does that do to put Iowa in that Big Ten championship game, right? Yep. So that's why these conferences did this, eliminated divisions, even though they're going to more teams. So they did it with the college football playoff resume in mind. So if that's why you're going to do it, then I think it should be part of your tiebreaker. Yep. No, I, I, I agree with that. 
but, uh, and, and I know case, people was, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't even help Kansas State. It helps yeah. Oklahoma. So yeah. I'm not even being biased. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I am with you. I think that it would make sense to let, hey, this is your college football playoff uh, ranking and, and let that dictate after a, a true head-to-head, not, hey, we've got a bunch of tied teams and one of them beat both, and but then the other two didn't play each other. Um, I know that it, it makes sense in theory, the rule that was set out here by the Big 12. But even with that, you start to think like yeah, your better option is probably just going off of that if you're wanting something for the strength of the conference. But I don't know. We'll we'll see how it plays out with the Big 12 this weekend. I, I mean, honestly, K-State's best chance at this is hoping that Texas Tech pulls a rabbit out of their hat for the second straight year and uh, somehow pulls off an upset in Austin. Uh, it seems very unlikely. I would doubt that it happens. Texas at home just seems like too much for uh, Texas Tech to overcome, especially with how much is predicated on running the football with Taj Brooks. And we know that Texas has just shut down anybody that can run this season. Is, so, just, is just a Texas loss enough, though? Because then you're in a three-way tiebreaker with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State still. Well, no, because you're in a four-way tie then. Because Texas would have a second loss. So that would invite a bunch of other things, and then you have to sort through that because then K-State hasn't played Oklahoma, Texas hasn't played Oklahoma State, so you have a lot more layers this. But as we know, the Big 12 does not seem to really know what they've clarified because they <laughs> basically sent out a thing like, here are the uh, the, the, the last part scenarios. And they were like, yeah, uh, there's actually a lot more here, but we're not gonna we're not going to publish those until we know we have to uh, if Texas loses on, on <laughs> Friday night. They basically night. said – if Texas loses, all hell breaks loose, and we might be into trouble because we still don't know our own rules. Yeah, it's it's stupid. I don't know. Uh, That's right why now, CFP. That's what it's simple. Yep. It's uh, it's been reported by multiple people this morning that there are over 120 outcomes that are technically still possible for uh, the Big 12 championship game that leaves seven teams still alive for a berth to the championship game. But not um, KU. Not KU, not KU. KU cannot make it. So anybody with three losses or less is still alive technically for the Big 12 title game. So West Virginia and Texas Tech still alive in the Big 12. You know what, the that, only- means? You know what that means for KU? RIP. What do you actually mean? Actually dead. KU, RIP. True, true. They actually are actually dead. dead. Actually dead. Uh, yeah, so basically, any of these teams could do it. We'll, we'll see, I guess. Uh I, I really do think the best the best hope for K State is Texas losing because you're not going to get losses from both OU and OSU at home and <laughs> and and, and if, if OU and Texas win and OSU loses OU still gets in I believe because they have the win over Texas uh, so they have beaten the the higher seeded team so it's it's a mess you're really hoping for a Texas loss so everybody send your love and support to Joey McGuire because he needs it. I know that some of you out there do not like the support that's been given to Joey McGuire by uh, members of K-State Online, but he needs it this week. We need it this week. So I am Team Joey, even though uh, he he has recently appeared on the uh, the Fraud Watch. I'll tell you this much. I won't put Joey on it for another whole year if he beats Texas this week. That's what my promise it? to Joey McGuire. What was Fraud Watch this week? I didn't see it. Uh, it hasn't been done because there's really been no new changes to it. Although Dion is probably moving up even more after the uh, the the show that went on there, uh, I would also say I think I'm put I'm going to put Kim Mulkey on there. I know she's not in the Big Twelve anymore, but uh, you know former Big Twelve coach, she deserves it. Lincoln Riley, former Big Twelve coach, he's on Fraud Watch. I Caitlin mean, Clark, yeah, Caitlin <laughs> Clark, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Caitlin Clark is definitely a fraud when she faces K State. You know, uh, so uh, sh- shout out to the K State women. They are Jeff, uh, Jeff officially Mitty in the top opposite. 25. Jeff Mitty, opposite of Fraud Watch. Now he's on fire. Yes. Yes. That yes. was a, to be honest, that was, it was, everyone's impressed by what they did against Iowa, of course. But that was a really mature win, the way they handled their business against Wisconsin. Yes. That, I mean, that's, I, that's always my big thing is you get that big win, you got to come out and take care of it. And I think there have been other teams under Jeff Mitty that would have come out and lost that game. This team came out and did it. So shout out to the K-State women, 4-0, up to number 16 in the top 25 that was just released today. And, so. and also shout out to the volleyball team. 
even after their big wins over Texas and BYU, they sweep Texas Tech twice, I think. So they're probably going to make the NCAA tournament. It's and gonna be borderline. Year, the the, the, the RPI year. is still pretty bad for for the for the Volley Cats. Uh, well, potential birth under Mansfield in his first year. Got to beat Got to beat Houston this week. See what happens. Uh, yeah, t- Texas Tech. I just talked up Joey McGuire. Gave you my full support. Their volleyball team. Uh, I don't want to be attached to that stink. They are ten and eighteen this season, but. Even as bad as Texas Tech volleyball is, who's only won three conference games, they did beat Wichita State this year. So <laughs> take that. Well, uh, you know, uh, enjoyable. A detail I'll add since we're just doing bizarre random stuff here mm-hmm. again. BYU, their non revenue sports are really good. They are. They're a great addition to the league, making the Big 12 very Pac 12 with uh, non revenue sports being successful. Yeah, soccer, volleyball. Um, probably missing one. I think they're good at women's basketball too. Well, there you go. That is uh, that's that's the full encapsulation of K State sports uh, from this week. Uh, K State basketball goes one and one. Uh, you know they they showed good fight against Pro- against Miami at the end and, and that Providence loss. Still, but yep. and Providence was and that's one of those where you might think going down there like okay, you just want to go one and one. Maybe it doesn't matter. Long term, it does matter for K State to have beaten Providence and not have lost that game and then played Georgia. Because George is going to be like a quad three game probably this season. Providence at the worst is going to be a quad two game. And so you get a quad two win and then you're lost to Miami. That's going to be quad one. Like it, it's not that big of a deal, especially since you, you were without Naquan Tomlin. You were without Day Day Ames. So there were, and Quez Glover. There were a lot of restrictions out in that Miami game. I thought they fought uh, well and hard enough. And, everything that, that went on down there. I, overall, I would say probably a pretty positive experience in the Bahamas for K-State. I mean, just they're three and two, right? So we played five games. Three of those five are against Miami, USC, and Providence. Yeah. Um, one of the other ones was South Dakota State. South Dakota State did just lose to UCF, interestingly enough, by three points. So I don't know if that means they're underrated, overrated, or, or what to make of it because UCF's actually had an interesting start where – they might not be as trash as I thought they'd be. Uh, you know, I, I thought looking at UCF at the start of the year, like that there was going to maybe be a chance that they were actually like pretty solid. Um, but I just I think they'll get overwhelmed by the course of the Big Twelve yeah. and everything else. But certainly not the uh, actual like the the worst possible thing. K State, K State needs to take care of these next three games like they're supposed to against Central Arkansas. Um, what do they play? North Alabama. Yeah. And there's one more. So this is not good podcasting. Sorry, folks. Trying to think of K State, the what they got left. Oral Roberts, Central Central Arkansas, Oral Roberts, and North or in North Alabama. Win those three games. You're yeah. six and two, right before your what if, is that the final stretch there? Um, before you play Chicago State, I guess when you get Villanova, LSU, Nebraska, Wichita State. Yeah. Yeah, no, that they're they'll be in fine shape, and uh, you know Villanova took a loss to uh, to Penn uh, earlier this week, so maybe they're you know not going to be in as good of a spot. LSU, I don't think is actually all that good. They're so um, the opportunities there. Villanova did bounce back by beating Maryland by seventeen. Yeah, that's true. They they dominated Maryland in that game. Yeah, at, one, so. at one point it was forty nine to fifteen. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I think I think K State's in a in a fine spot, and you just you're you're waiting for when Naquan Tomlin can get back on the team, and then obviously I think you'll get another piece when Quez Glover gets added into the mix, you know, way down the road. But uh, there, I'm not I'm not in panic mode about K State basketball, and even though they're three and two, and I, I was pretty I got to a pretty low point on them before the season started. I I feel much better about K State basketball right now through the first five games than I really thought was possible. I. There, there's a scenario out there where K-State could have an extra win right now, and I wouldn't feel as good as I do about them at this point in time because I like the way they've played. I like the way some of the pieces are going, and guys are figuring out new setting, new team, new roles, all that stuff. Um, but, you know, we got a good Arthur Kaluma game down in, in the Bahamas. Tyler Perry came through for you. Um, I think you'd like to see a little more consistency from Cam Carter still, but I, I have no issues with how he's maybe, played. So far maybe, this year, but he almost but, scored 30 twice. 
That is true. Yeah, he did. He did bounce back pretty strongly uh, at the end of the game against Miami too. So I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not too worried about K State basketball right now. I think this is a team that, um, yet again, is probably going to take off once we get to conference play. They're going to have a a situation where they're just trying to survive a really tough non conference schedule relative to uh, the pieces you have on this team, and then you'll be ready to go uh, once you kind of move into your uh, current role with. Uh, with the, the conference play and having a, a full roster at your disposal. I agree. I, I, I don't think there's uh, anything to be concerned about right now. All right, there you go. That's the KSO show for this Monday. You get football, basketball, volleyball, whatever you wanted and needed about K-State. We gave it to you on this Monday. We will be back on Wednesday recapping what went down with Chris Kleiman at his media availability on Tuesday. Basketball game on Wednesday night then. The Cats hosting Central Arkansas at 7 o'clock, and then everybody will be back in Manhattan on Saturday at 7 as well for K-State, Iowa State, as it is Farmageddon Week in Manhattan. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.